Welcome to this session on data mesh versus data fabric in Microsoft Fabric. So this is what we're going to talk about today. But before I do that, before I talk about the fun things, if I'm allowed, if my computer will let me, let's see, I'm going to introduce myself. So my name is Martha Moengen, or Martha Moengen, if you're from Norway and want to try the Norwegian way. Um, I'm a managing data analyst at Suplasteria. That's a consultancy firm that's international, but quite big in Norway. And I'm doing all the things data. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. And when I'm not doing the data things, I like to be outdoors, uh, of course, because I'm Norwegian. I do skiing and trail climbing, and I collect the highest peaks in Norway. So if any of you do climbing, let me know. It's always someone that does. And if you come to Norway, we can climb together. Of course, it needs to be a competition. All right, so this is me. Uh, feel free to connect on any of my social medias if you want to continue the discussion after this session. And I will be here all week, too. All right, but let's go back to the more exciting stuff, the things we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about what data mesh is, what data fabric is, and also how can you do this inside of Microsoft Fabric. And we need to like separate these two a bit because the data mesh and the data fabric, that's methodology. But the Microsoft Fabric, that's a tool. So we're going to see how can these methodologies be uh, applied into our Microsoft Fabric as the tool. That's the agenda. OK, let's get cracking. So we're going to start out with the data mesh. What is data mesh? So data mesh is, um, yeah, it's made up of these four pillars. So you have the data product, the domains, the federated governance, and also the self-serve data platform. We're going to go through this uh, and then see, OK, where is this then in Fabric? Or can you do this in Fabric, Microsoft Fabric? I need to be good at telling you what I'm talking about on this so we don't get confused. OK, so let's start out with the data products. So data product thinking has been something that it's been around for a while, uh, but maybe not into the data world. So now it's this new way of thinking that we're going to productify all the data that we're delivering out to people. And a data product needs to be has some sort of definition. Um, and again, there's a lot on the data mesh uh, approach out there, a lot of great articles, a lot of great definitions. But these details might vary a bit, but you can say that a data product needs to be trusted, it needs to be reusable, so it's something that someone else can actually use and then take advantage of after you have delivered it. You need it to be accessible so that people can, 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 can use it. It should be owned by someone, there should be some governance on it. It should be discoverable and interoperable with also other parts of your uh, data ecosystem. So this is a data product. And if we dig into sort of the technical parts of this, that could mean that the data product needs some input ports. So obviously, you need to pull data into your product somehow. And then you need output ports so that people can access your data product, and hopefully in a standardized way that you're delivering them. You need metadata, so some data about your data product to make it easier to manage. Um, and you also should know something about the observability of a data product. So where is it coming from? When was it updated? What's the timeliness of this? And also data quality. Can I know something about what the quality of this data product is to also make it easier to trust for other people? All right, so that was the data product thing. The next one is domains. So in the data mesh world, you have domains that, I mean, it's always this drawing, this figure. That's usually the domains if you go into uh, architecture diagrams. And inside a domain, you have uh, teams and people that belong together. You have data that is somehow connected to that domain. And you also have technology within that domain. So that's how you group them. And each domain is usually co connected to some sort of business domain. It doesn't have to be. Uh, and for a lot of people or a lot of organizations, you need a lot of maturity to maybe to be super ready for the total data mesh approach. And we're going to come back to this. But usually, you are going to uh, name your domains uh, the same as your business uh, domain. So it could be marketing or sales or finance, for instance. That could be one domain. Also, you will have then multiple domains inside your organization. That's 
this natural grouping of people, technology, and tools. And data. Okay, so uh, what are the goal of the domains? Well, each separate domain should be autonomous on its own. Um, and also the modeling and the ETL, the data transformations and so on, that will be managed by each separate domain. That also means that they need their own data engineers and their own data ana analyst, uh, analysts and own technical people to do that. Um, and then, then, then they will develop their own data products. So that's part of the domain um, yeah, realm. So you need all these people that know all these things about the data inside each domain. And that's where it might become a bit challenging sometimes. Okay, so that's the domains. Then we have federated governance. So traditionally, we have had uh, usually IT uh, departments in an organization. So we have really centralized IT departments, and sometimes they're huge, a lot of things going on there, and maybe a bit uh, isolated, maybe a bit siloed. So they will be the ones that decide, okay, this should be the format of the data product, this is how we want to deliver it, and so on. That's how it traditionally has been. But with the data mesh approach, we want to federate that governance. We want to have each separate domain be the owners and hold the governance of their own domain. So then they can decide, okay, this is how we're gonna develop this product. This is the logic that I need inside my data product. This is how I'm gonna keep it interoperable. I will have my data owners, my people inside my domain so that they will take care of my data. So we're federating the governance. It's not centralized anymore. Federated. Oh, wow, that was an animation. Cool. Okay, I wasn't aware that I did that. Um, okay, so why do we do this? Well, we want to ensure scalability. So because now we're federating the governance, we're gonna set up a lot of domains, right? And then they can scale because they can do their own thing in theory. Um, it's also helping with autonomy because they decide, each domain decide what they're gonna do, so then they can be autonomous. Um, it also helps with accountability because each domain, they are in charge of their data solutions and their data. And then also this makes them more independent, so you don't have to count on this big, maybe heavy, maybe a bit slow IT centralized department. That's the idea of the federated governance. But but, there is a big but. Let me click again. Oh. So, for those of you who know me, know that I am a governance person. I like to talk about that, because that's always what's messing up the beautiful data things that I'm creating, the governance around it. And data mesh is pretty cool, because, I mean, it's gonna help us with scalability, autonomy, accountability, independence. Oh, that's great, cool. But, sometimes, organizations tend to forget about the central governance. So even though we are federating things in data mesh, oh, don't forget about the central governance. It's, for me, the enabler to make data mesh a success. So we need some centralization. You need some standards, best practices, guidelines. For instance, this should be the format that we're using. This is how we're gonna make data products accessible. This is where we should document all the data products for an entire organization. You have to centralize parts of it. So yeah, this is like my, oh, I always need to repeat this. Let's try and focus on that too. Okay, but we are federating the governance, but oh, don't forget about the centralized part too. You need it. Okay, shush, federated governance. The last pillar is self-serve uh, data platform. So what do we mean by that? This is also part of this centralization that I've been talking about. Um, so the point here is that each domain is gonna figure out their own solutions and build their own things. And maybe they also have set, like, their own data engineers and own technical people. But through the centralized part of this data mesh approach, you should have some sort of self-serve data platform. The idea here is that you have that as a foundation, and then you can deliver parts of the tools that's needed to uh, each domain. So sometimes this is called like infrastructure as, um, infrastructure as a platform, or infrastructure, infrastructure as a service, um, where for, for instance, one domain can say, I need um, data factory to orchestrate 
can you please give me an Azure SQL database, and so on, and then that's provisioned for you. That could be one way to do that. So, and also the self-serve data platform should help you with some of the centralization and standardization. Because if you don't do that, and this happens a lot <laughs> with the organizations that are diving headfirst into data mesh, that you end up with completely different technology stacks. So you might have Databricks over there, Snowflake over there, um, maybe some on-prem over here, and then that's not interoperable. You're missing really uh, important part of the data mesh approach. Okay, so. When did, sorry, can I, can I ask, when did we start? What time was that? Cool, cool, okay. I'm a bit confused with the time, but we're good, we're doing okay. Nice, so that was the four pillars. Uh, data product, domains, federated governance, and self-serve data platform. If you look at this in one picture, it, I mean, ta-da, it could look something like this. And the point here is that you're wrapping uh, your solution or data mesh approach into federated governance, and you have a self-serve uh, data platform as a foundation. And then you have separate domains, and then each domain are owning and building their own data products. So they can look like this. And then the mesh part about this, that's where the data products becomes connected and shareable. Um, so the point here is that one data product is delivering value on its own, but another domain can then take a data product from this first domain and then use that to build their data product and so on. So data product could be a building block to build another data product or a part of another data product. So the point here is that each domain has got the responsibility to serve other domains with their data products. And when it comes to the cultural part of this, it's important that um, we, need to, we need to do some change management to see and to make the organization feel like, oh, cool, my domain have, we have all these uh, data products. We're so cool. And we have all these users of our data products. That should be something that they should be measured on to make it something that they're going to work towards. All right. So this is the data mesh approach. What are the benefits of this? Well, we talked about this a bit, but it's the autonomy that we have domains and they can do things on their own. Uh, we have scalability. So if you need more things or other things, in theory, you can just create new domains. Um, and also this enforces some more uh, closer collaboration between business and traditional IT, because you would have technical people inside each domain to actually, that actually really knows that that domain and really knows those business needs and that data to build those data products. All right. But what are the challenges? We touched upon these two. Well, there is a huge risk, even, maybe, sometimes, to um, create isolated data hubs. Because each domain is going to be so, so autonomous and so independent that they're going to build things that is not uh, cohesive and not part of your entire data ecosystem, following the standards. And that means that you can end up with building data products that are not actually serving the organizational data model. So you might build things that actually don't connect. And also you might end up with different sources of truth. Ah, that's not good. Um, and also you might end up missing this harmonized strategy because everyone is just going to go in their own direction. That's also why I'm stressing the centralized part here so much. You need some sort of centralized force to make sure that we are working in the same direction with data mesh. Okay, that was data mesh. Then let's have a look at data fabric. So that's our next um, topic, the theoretical topic. And I have, a, I mean, I have a Gartner definition here. It's a bit boring, but I mean, you can read it if you want. Um, what I noticed when I, okay, I'm going to have this session, I really want to dive uh, deep into the theoretical parts uh, of data mesh and data fabric, these two methodologies. What I found was that data mesh is quite defined. There are changes and differences uh, in how you define a data mesh, but it's, it's, it's quite new and it's, it's quite standardized already. We are, are agreeing on certain aspects. The data fabric way of thinking is much more it depends on who you ask. What article are you reading or what book are you diving into? How you are defining this? Also, the data fabric uh, methodology has been around for each, actually for a couple of years. It's not new. 
It's just that last year, Gartner, as one of the, <laughs> one of the organizations, pulled it up again as something. I mean, they didn't rebrand it or anything, but they started again to talk about data fabric as the way of doing things instead of data mesh. Maybe because they started to see the challenges that we just talked about with the data mesh approach. So they sort of changed, changed what they were talking about a bit. And then Microsoft Fabric came, and then Data Fabric was like, oh, this is this new thing. But it's not. It's not actually this new thing. It's been around for quite some time. But that means that it might be a bit more difficult to define, but I'm going to do my best. And let's see what we can learn on Data Fabric. OK. So Data Fabric is um, data, it's a, it's a data management design uh, way of thinking. And the goal is that you have flexible, reusable, and augmented data integration pipelines, services, and semantics. OK, cool. And also, you want to leverage active metadata, knowledge graphs, semantics, and machine learning to augment data integration design and delivery. <sighs> OK, cool. What does that mean? Well, to me, it means this. It means that we're putting the technology in the center of what we're building. And we want the technology to help us uh, make our data solution great and work perfectly. So in the data mesh approach, we're trying to think more about the people. So we have business domains as part of a centralized thing here. We have data products. With, that's like a logical thing that we humans make up, right? That's something that makes sense for our business. But data fabric is more focused on, OK, how can I automate things? And well, these things, it's about how can I automate things? Can I use knowledge graphs to make it easier for me to have control over my data? Is there anything that I can know more about observability? Like, what can I know about my data and where it's coming from? How often is it updated and so on? Uh, can we pull in data ops in here? Metadata activation that was also mentioned. Can we use metadata to get better control of our data and then also use that again to automate? And also augmentation. So are there any machine learning features or AI features I can use to make my life easier with data? So this is one way of summarizing the data fabric uh, approach. And then this next drawing, this is a way to try and specify it a bit from the technology point of view. And again, if you go and talk to different organizations, they're going to tell you different stories about data fabric. Because a lot of organizations, even though it's a methodology, I see tool, tools using this as, oh, we can deliver data fabric. Let us show you this architecture. And then they're showing the technology components that is going to leverage it. And then they sort of completely forget about the people. But it could look something like this. I'm trying to like, mm, make it just uh, not like, specific for one tool. But you will have data sources going in. Then you need a data integration layer. Yes, cool. Um, and then you need a data catalog. So data catalog is an important part of data fabric because this is where you're going to know all about your data. Where is it? How can I use it? Um, is it accessible? And so on. Then you're doing data modeling and ETL development. And then you have data visualization or data uh, consumption on top. So that's one way of drawing the uh, data fabric diagram. OK. So what are the benefits? I mean, oh, yes, there's so many benefits if you read through this and if you go into the documentation. It's enhanced data quality, efficiency, agility, improved integration, accessibility and analytics. You strengthen the data security, governance, accelerate the system integration, to touch market, facilitate better business insight and digital innovation. OK, cool. But OK, if you look at the challenges of this, None of that was new. That was just basic things that we're trying to do with all our data platform solutions. So all the benefits that Data Fabric is delivering is just what we've been trying to do forever. We want to know our data. We want it to be secure. We want it to deliver value. All of these things. So why is this so cool? Why is this so important? OK. I'll come back to that uh, in our next block. And then, ah, cool, we're running good on time, too. OK, so that was the data fabric part, the theoretical part, one way of trying to, like, ah, let's box this into something, technology being in the focus of this, of this definition. 
Okay, so how do we do this in Microsoft Fabric? How can we pull all of these things into Microsoft Fabric? That's our next topic. So hopefully now you understand, um, understand uh, these theoretical methodologies a bit. How can we actually implement this in this Microsoft Fabric tool? Okay, so we're gonna start out with the data mesh approach. How can we put this into Fabric specifically? Or is this even possible? Is Fabric, Microsoft Fabric made for this or not? I mean, it's called Fabric, what does that mean? And so on. Well, let's see. Let's start with the data product part. So we, so we in, the in, in the last um, part, we said that it needs to be accessible, it needs to be interoperable, trusted, reusable, and discoverable, the data products. This is what we want our data products to be. Well, how do we do that in Microsoft Fabric? Well, the accessibility part is <laughs> sort of automatically <laughs> made available through you through one link. So for those of you who know uh, Microsoft Fabric, you know that one lake is the foundation of where you store all your data. You have one one lake for your entire tenant. And the cool thing about uh, that is that it enables us some standardization right from the start on how we access and, and, um, and pull data into our solution. So one lake, there's multiple ways to pull it in, like data into our uh, da data product. You can use data flows, pipelines, Spark notebooks, you can copy files. And then you can pull it out again. If you really want it to be out, you can use SQL endpoints or the, just the data lake connection. Or if you're building semantic models, those as an entity inside of Fabric is just reusable on its own because you can build multiple reports on top of that. That's on its own is also a data product. And then you also have shortcut um, and mirroring coming. So one lake is helping us. And, and to me, one lake is the most enabling feature of Fabric. This is, this is, that's why I think it's going to work. Right. Okay, so that's the um, accessibility part. What about the interoperable part? I already uh, touched upon it on the one leg side. Um, the fact that we are standardizing, uh, or Fabric is helping us to standardize on uh, formats inside of one leg is making things also interoperable. You're building tables uh, inside of your data Fabric one leg solution. That means that they can be reused. And also, again, the semantic model that you can build inside of Fabric is then reusable, again, all, all over the place inside of Fabric. And you can also uh, connect it to SQL endpoints and so on. Um, also, um, yeah, some of the metadata that we get, so this is part of that screenshot. You can know things about sensitivity, ref was it, when was it refreshed, is it endorsed, uh, where, is it, where is it placed, all of these things. I mean, that's part of Fabric and how you're managing your, uh, your data. That's also going to help you with your interoperability. Okay. Then we have the trusted part. We need to trust our data. And we want to know things about the ownership, who owns this data product. We want to know, is it, like, is it secure? Can I use it? Um, should I not use it? Is this sensitive data? Um, what's the SLA on this? Or is the domains going to deliver this data every day, every hour? When is it refreshed? Uh, and also data quality. So inside of Fabric on its own, yes, you can know, know some things about this um, if, you, if you look. Uh, some of the metadata is going to help you with this. But to get that full overview, you are dependent on this additional tool, Purview. So Purview is the data catalog. Uh, the Microsoft uh, delivers, and you need Purview to give you more on the information that, uh, uh, about this and also make this more accessible and easier to, to search and get that knowledge. So, yeah, I mean, they are easy to integrate and so on, but you are dependent on this additional tool, I will say, to get that full, full uh, overview of your data product. Okay, the product should also be uh, reusable. And we already talked about this. You have semantic models, tables, Power BI reports, and the output ports of these uh, items are uh, available in one link. And then you have the discoverable, discoverable feature. So inside of Fabric, there are different, um, there, is, uh, there, there are a couple of places you can go look. I hope that we have time for a demo, and then I'll show you that. 
Um, and then you can, then in that sense, you can discover your data because there is a place to go. But there's also a way to endorse or promote and certify your asset inside of Fabric. And this could be a really good way to have them uh, uh, discoverable. So if you, for instance, are certifying a semantic model and then you define for your domain that the semantic model is actually a data product, then the users that are connecting to Power BI desktop and so on are going to see, oh, this is a data product. That means that I can trust it. It's available to me. I can actually use it. It's it got value and so on. So this is a really nice specific feature that you can leverage inside of Fabric to actually, ah, this is a data product. This is certified or endorsed. OK. So we went through uh, some of the specifics, how you can do this. But are there any limitations? Well, yes, I think so. Because in Fabric, um, it would be cool if you could actually tag your data as a product. Not uh, you need to, because now we have to decide that certified needs means product. Maybe that doesn't make sense to your organization. What if we could have tied it as a product and then been able to actually follow the journey of that data product in Fabric? That would have been cool. And that's not there yet. Um, also, it would be nice if it was possible to document the data product inside of Fabric so that also the developers could easily access, oh, OK, this is that, this is this. It's connected to this, uh, this business user and so on. Um, and also, even put in like, data product contracts, so SLAs. Because you need to know, is my data product going to be delivered to me every day, every hour, or is, uh, or is it not? So that it's easier for other domains to reuse the data product. What if we could have had that directly connected to the data product in Fabric? Ah, that would have been nice. So there are some limitations here. OK, that was data products. What about domains inside of Microsoft Fabric? So domains are quite cool. That actually exists. And I think when Microsoft created uh, Microsoft Fabric, they put in domains to like, oh, yes, we're thinking about data mesh here. Here you go. You're welcome. Here's the domain feature. So this is uh, one way of solving that for us, I think. So inside of Microsoft, you can uh, group all your workspaces into domains. So it is a way to group your assets and your development and so on into domains. And then you can decide if those domains should be business domains. So you actually go with the full data mesh approach, saying that maybe you have a marketing domain and a sales domain. Or if you're doing more of a traditional centralized hybrid way, so you might have this domain called um, central engineering, but still regrouping that. And then that's serving uh, data to other domains. Oh, there's so many opportunities here. So you don't have to go hardcore with data mesh, but you can. And the domain feature is, um, is available inside of Fabric. But there are some limitations. I would have liked more from this feature. We are missing um, some more detailed management uh, of each uh, separate domain. So today, you can automate inside a domain, say that this person is allowed to certify or endorse my products inside my domain. So you can set up data stewards and so on that can manage your domain and say these workspaces should be inside of that. You can do things, some things. But I want to do more. What if we could set up policies that were specific for each domain so that they could automate how we are, I don't know, develop, developing things inside each domain and so on? That would have been super cool. Super cool. Yeah. So there's some things there. It's not, it's not everything we want yet, but, but um, it's definitely a starting point on domains. OK. Then what about the federated governance part? Um, oh, the governance, I mean, of course, this is more about people. So you can, can again decide that, oh, this is the processes, this is the governance I'm going to use, all of that, and then pray that it's actually going to work. But you do, or my, like my favorite thing is when the tool can help you govern or enforce the governance. This is what we want to happen, right? So inside of Fabric, Microsoft Fabric, you can set up domain admins and then also domain contributors. And then they have some opportunities and possibilities to actually do things inside of Fabric. So there, it's possible to federate the governance in that sense. So it's going to help you a bit. 
but I mean, we would have liked more here too. Um, what if we could have set up development standards so that that's something that needs to be followed for each domain that could be managed by, for instance, the data steward or the data owners in the domain? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and also, um, we need for, it would have been cool if we had more uh, opportunities to have granular control on the access levels and that you can use the, the, use the domains and the owners there to also give, uh, give access to the domains. Um, and one thing that is missing in general is the master data management integration. So that doesn't exist inside of Fabric or dependent on an external tool to do master data management. Okay, then self-serve data platform. What about this? Well, that's sort of Fabric. So it's really, it's really, that's one thing that, yes, Microsoft Fabric is delivering on this in a really good way. So Microsoft Fabric is a software as a service, but you as your organization can decide to treat it as a data self-serve data platform. So you can say that, okay, their marketing domain, I'm creating this domain for you. Here you go, go crazy in that domain. Now you can create workspaces and build things in there and you have everything you need available to you right there. You can do real-time analytics, Power BI, engineering, whatever. It's just there. So yes, that actually works really good. And it's also helping us with the standardization that I, ah, that I really want us to focus on with the data mesh approach uh, as well, the central part. That is going to help you govern this. Cool. So that was data mesh. We're moving over to data fabric. So we talked about all these things. We put the technology in the center of this. Um, what about these things do we have inside of Microsoft Fabric? Well, you have the data integration, obviously. There is, oh, there are so many ways to integrate the Fabric and pull data in, and also out if you need. Um, we have data modeling, ETL development, all of that you can do inside of Fabric. You can even decide if you want to do with SQL or Python, traditional data warehousing, lake housing. You have options, real-time analytics, machine learning, ah, you name it, right? Uh, and then you have data visualization. So we have Power BI on top, uh, of course. Cool, so that exists. What about the technology part? Oh yeah, sorry, let me talk about that, the data catalog part. So as I already mentioned, yes, there is a data hub inside of Microsoft Fabric and I will do my best to have time to show you this, um, but it's not that much there yet. So you would have needed Purview as an external tool to ma really make this easier to govern, have better control. So that's why it's like not, it's not really green, but now it's green, so yeah. But it's not inside of Microsoft Fabric. You need an additional license to use uh, the full features of Purview, the data catalog. Cool. Then, what about the technology? Well, again, here also depends on the definition, and it depends on what we want to do, because you can really automate a lot of things inside of Fabric, of course you can. Um, and you can know things about observability. Uh, if you want to, you can know how are my pipelines running. You can set up data activator to help you get alerts uh, and to see how are, how are my things performing. Because you can use data activator for data quality if you just create a report or something to monitor on data quality. That's a hot tip, by the way, do that. Uh, it's all about creativity when you come to data activator. Um, and of course, you can set up data ops, and then also augmentation, because you have Copilot built into this thing, so it can help you with everything uh, that you're really uh, developing here. But then on knowledge graphs, that's not in Fabric. That doesn't exist. Um, and then metadata activation, again, it's like, oh, how much metadata activation do you want? How automatic and automatic do you want it to be? And today, I would say that it's not, that automatic. I want, I mean, I want Fabric to just solve all of these things for me so that I don't have to set up these crazy policies and develop all these things to make it work. So, yeah, it's there, but like, I would have liked more. Um, okay, so trying to summarize limitations. We need Purview for more advanced data management, uh, metadata management, and also we don't have knowledge graphs on data Fabric. And I'm going to do my best now to try I have a little bit of a demo. What do you see? You don't see that. That's my fault. Let me fix it. Mm. 
Oh, wait. Let me just duplicate my screen. Ta-da! Okay. This is Microsoft Fabric, everybody. Um, and the things I want to show you are connected to, well, all the things we've gone through now. And I want to start with the domain settings. So if I go into my admin portal, and I go to domains, here you see the domains that I were talking about. You can create domains inside of Microsoft Fabric. Here I have created finance, supply chain management, drilling and well. This is for an energy company. And I can go into one uh, domain and see that I've created subdomains because this is from, a, from an actual client and they are not mature and ready for the data mesh approach, the total, complete data mesh approach. I don't think many really are, to be honest. Um, so they're going in a hybrid solution, hybrid way. So they're going with, uh, we're going to centralize parts of this. We're going to do uh, supply chain management engineering, and then we're going to do supply chain management consumption. And then we're going to centralize the engineering part as part of our digital team. Then we have uh, the consumption too. If I go into engineering sub, um, uh, subdomain, I see these two uh, workspaces. So here we decided to the divide into the actual deliverables. So we have a spend model that's in one workspace. You have a procurement model that's in another workspace. There's so many ways to do this. So this is one way. And that's how we've grouped the, the, all the workspaces. If I go into my domain settings, you see that I can give it a name. I can give it a description. I can give it an image, which is going to help me make it easier to understand what I'm looking at later. I can give it an admin. So uh, who is the admin of this domain? That could be the data steward. It could be the data owner. It depends how you organize your uh, governance. And then you can set up contributors. So you can say that the entire organization can contribute to this domain, or specific users or security groups, or only have the tenants uh, and domain admins do that. Then you can also say that we're going to set up a default domain. So this is part of the policies that you can apply. So I can say that every time Emilia, Emily running, she's here, so go talk to her. But every time she creates a workspace, that's going to go straight into supply chain management. So that, uh, that's automatic and automatic for us. Because she might be the data steward of supply chain management, so that makes sense. Everything she's doing, that should be there. Uh, and also you can delegate parts of um, your uh, governance and policies. So I can say that all the users in the domain or specific security groups in my domain are allowed to endorse or certify, promote my items. The, and then that could be, because we talked about this, that could be they are allowed to actually um, define that this is a product because they can give the check of certified friends. Cool. That's the domains. Now, let's go into One Lake Data Hub. So this is the data catalog that you find inside of Microsoft. But I mean, it's really, it's development specific. So this is not made for business. They will not understand maybe what they're looking at here uh, if they just want to know something about the finance data or whatever. But here you can filter on specific domains. So let's go to supply chain management. And you can see, OK, cool. What are the assets that I have inside of my total domain? What are the workspaces? You can filter on, are any of my items endorsed? So, oh, cool, I have a certified one. That's maybe a data product. I have a management semantic model. And also, I've promoted this uh, lake house, maybe because it consists other data products. Then, I could go in here and look at the app, because I want to know more about management the semantic model. I don't understand it. I want to know more. So I can view lineage. Then I'm sent to the workspace that this management, um, management semantic model was uh, inside. And then I directly see the lineage. So here I see, OK, my management semantic model, it got one child item. So I've created one report on top of that. That's good to know. And it's also highlighting this specific lineage view for me. So I see that I've pulled uh, data from the procurement gold lake house and the spend gold lake house. So actually here I created data products from other existing data products to create a new data product. Um, and then I created uh, reports on top of that. 
And I can see that I have uh, certified my solution. And also, you see that, that I've set up a confidential uh, security label on this. Because this is also something you can do that's going to help you with the metadata management. So inside of Fabric, you can use data loss prevention to help you um, set up. This is, uh, this is data that I don't want to, <laughs> that shouldn't be shared with everyone, for instance. And then the t every time the semantic model, for instance, is updated or published or you build a report, an admin can get an, uh, get an email, oh, this, is, this happened, my data is uh, doing something it shouldn't, or even stop it from doing that. So those, data, uh, uh, those policies are changing every day and becoming better. First time I tried it, you couldn't really do much apart from labeling. Now you can apply some policies, and if it's not here yet, it's here soon. So this is also coming. Cool, I'm running out of time, so I'm just quickly going to show you the Purview Hub. So I to told you that to get the full data flow, no, um, data catalog experience, you need to go to the external data catalog solution, Purview. I mean, it's not external. Someone's not going <laughs> to like me, like that I t said it that way, but, but it's uh, an additional tool that is integrated to Fabric. Um, but you have this. Uh, the pre preview, preview hub inside of Fabric. That's going to give you some insights and some information. So here you can see the overview report. You can get an overview of all my items, all my assets. What am I using? Am I using pipelines? Have I endorsed them? How good are we doing this? Um, and here you see I'm not doing that well. I mean, I only endorse 10% of my data pipelines. <sighs> That's not good, or maybe it is. I don't know. It depends on the governance you set up. But this could be a really good tool for data stewards, data, uh, data owners, and so on to, ah, oh, this is how our data ecosystem is doing. So this is made a data activation. It's helping us to fix things and have control. OK, cool. And yeah, there's more things here you can, uh, you can look at as well. But in the interest of time, let me see if I can back to my other view. And wrap things up. Ha, it worked crazy. Where did I put my, there. OK, so what did we do? Ah, oh, we did so many things. We went to what is data mesh, in theory? What is data fabric, in theory? Not that tangible, I think, but still, OK, cool. Um, and then what, what could this look like inside of Microsoft Fabric? Can you use it? Are there any limitations? So can we conclude on anything? Can we summarize? Is there, yeah, is there an obvious conclusion here for us? So first question, can you implement data mesh in Microsoft Fabric? I think you can. The reason I think you can is, are there any other tool that is going to help you more? than this. I mean, I have super high expectations to this because it's a software as a service. I want it to solve my problems for me. But what about if you set up your own data database and data pipeline over there, you set up your own transformation tool, it's not going to make it easier. So you will be more dependent on setting up the governance, be stricter, have policies, have rules. So I think Microsoft Firebase is going to help you with this implementation especially because it's going to help you with the centralization and standardization. And everything is actually going to be in this place here, right? And that's going to help you not lose control. What about Data Fabric? Can you implement that inside of Microsoft Fabric? Well, from the traditional way of thinking of Data Fabric, you would like to be super hardcore tech person, automate everything, code everything, be cool with the metadata activation and do things. Like that was the old way. Uh, now, inside of Microsoft uh, Fabric, you, I mean, it's a software as a service, so you're not supposed to do all these hardcore tech things. But yes, as we saw, it will help you with metadata activation. It will help you to automate things. And there's a lot of things that you don't have to do now because it's already done, because it's serving it to you as a software as a service. And that's not a bad thing. That's just making you quicker go towards the end, end goal, which is working with the actual data. You don't have to spend hours and months and weeks, years, I don't know, on setting up infrastructure and so on. That's a good thing. So which one should you choose? Should you do data fabric? Should you do data mesh? 
I think uh, even though the tools are going to help us to make life easier, the people, the processes, the governance, that's still going to be super important. We're not stopping. Like, that's not what we need to do, right? Um, so I think that a lot of gov uh, organizations are going to use data fabric without thinking about the fact that they're using data fabric because you are, you are thinking about autonomy, automation, metadata, all of these things anyways. And I also think that with the data mesh approach, um, we need to wrap it up. With the data mesh approach, I think a lot of organizations are diving headfirst without maybe being mature enough. Because you do need to have, you need to have thought that through before we just, oh, cool, federate, now do that, do that. That's easy, go crazy, each domain can do whatever they want. So I think be, be a bit careful if you want to do the complete theoretical data mesh approach. And don't forget about the centralization. And I think Microsoft Fabric can help you with that because it is going to force some sort of standardization and centralization for you. OK, that was it. Thank you so much. <laughs>